Well, it is great to be here at this conference. I uh, appreciate so very much Brother Kerry and, and Thomas and the other board members. And um, we've been at this project for over a decade now. I call it a project. I know it's a conference, but I kind of look at it as a project, like we're doing this almost 30-year project of working our way through the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. You know, uh, just every every year, take a take a article, a paragraph, and we're just going to dig into it, think about the topic, and then next year work on the second one. So we're about halfway through this project uh, so far. And so I've been giving this some. Um, it's a kind of focus our attention on the theme coming out of that first paragraph of the, uh, I mean, yeah, the first paragraph of that article on good works, which is basically simply just answering the question, what are good works? What, what are these good works that we're talking about? Uh, and so just to kind of put it on the bottom shelf, that first paragraph, which is a short paragraph there in the confession, basically states what good works are in a positive sense, and then in a negative sense. And so positively it says that these good works are those things that God has revealed in His Holy Word. Uh, God has revealed it in His Holy Word. So that's on the positive side. And then on the negative side, sort of saying it negatively, uh, it, it says... They are not things. When we talk about good works, we're not talking about things. These things You can't put if things on this list of good works if they're just coming out of blind zeal or just man-made good intentions. And so that's, that's sort of the, the big picture where we're at today is thinking that it's only things, and that word only, exclusively, only things that God has said are good works. And they're not things, if I could just put it bluntly, things that we just make up. <laughs> we can't just go making stuff up and say that's what's good, just out of our own mind, our own good intentions, those things. So that's sort of, I'll, I'm just putting it on the table. That's my sermon. Actually, I'm pretty much done. But since we have some more time, uh, let's go ahead and look at that passage of Scripture that Brother Kerry reminded us of just a moment ago. I want to kind of drill into that verse 8 of Micah chapter 6. Verse 8, a very classic passage, where Micah says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. He has told you what is good. God has already proclaimed to you, He has shown to you, He has manifested to you what is good and what the Lord requires. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. To do justice to love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Now, I know we're in a room full of preachers here today, and so you look at that and say, hey, there's three imperative, there are imperatives, there's my sermon, uh, I've got three points, it's cake, let's just roll with it. But before we get to those three imperatives, and especially we as Southern Baptists, I think, Carrie, sometimes we like to jump to those imperatives, what we're supposed to do. But let's not jump over that indicative, that first line. And I, and I notice that a lot of times when we talk about this classic passage, many of you have probably preached it, we jump over that first indic indicative and jump right to the three imperatives, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. I'll get to those three imperatives and try to think biblically about them and make some connections to other places in Scripture. But I want us to think about that first line when Micah says, He has shown you... O oh man, what is good? Or he has told you, however you want to translate that verb, told, show in King James, told in other languages, it's proclaimed, make manifest. Notice what he says. He, say, he doesn't say, I'm about to tell you. He says, God has already told you. And I, I, I want to focus on that phrase a second and that past tense of that verb and so maybe unpack this a little bit more. Before I believe, I'll go ahead and lay my cards on the table. I believe what Micah is doing here and what God is intending here in, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in Micah 6, verse 8, is to connect the mandate to the Ten Commandments, to the Decalogue, to the Moral Law. Now I'm going I'm to make a case for that in a minute. 
if there's any objections. Uh, I'll, I'll make a case for it in a minute. But if I could just have sort of a little personal word of testimony about the Ten Commandments in my personal life. Um, have been, I've kind of in the last several years, I guess it's probably been about eight years ago, um, preached through the Ten Commandments. Well, let me back up. There's been several places in my life, and I'm sure you could have similar testimony, that have been sort of uh, times when things in your mind have kind of shifted or gone to the next level and sort of this paradigm shift. Of course, my first one was as a preteen boy, understanding for the first time that I was a sinner and I, needed, I, re, re, I deserved the punishment from a holy God and that Jesus Christ took my punishment upon himself. I mean, that, that's, that's the radical life change that the gospel brings. And then several years later, another very instrumental change in my life, I guess it was in seminary, when I really came to grips with the doctrine of inerrancy and infallibility and sufficiency. Don't get me wrong, I believed the Bible before. I was raised in church, I was a believer, I was a Christian. I dedicated my life to Christ, to full-time ministry by that time. But it was really in seminary that I really came to grips, or, or maybe I should say the doctrine of inerrancy gripped me, and, and I hadn't been able to let it go, that I could put my full weight on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That was a game changer. That was a game changer there. And then several years later, came to the doctrines of grace. And many of you can give personal testimony of that as well. When everything in Scripture seems to come alive at a different level. I was actually a pastor. I was pastoring the church I'm still at now. And through my own preaching, uh, of after being convinced of the inerrancy and sufficiency of Scripture, open the Bible and see what it says. And the doctrines of grace opened up to me and you know what kind of a change that makes in our soul and the gratitude to a holy God that sovereignly draws us to himself and we have the privilege of preaching that good news message and several years later there was another change in my thinking relating to eschatology I won't go into that today Carrie but uh, there, that was a pretty radical change in my life as well but then Several years ago, I preached a series of sermons on the Ten Commandments. Now, I believed the Ten Commandments. I'd been preaching the Ten Commandments. But something in spending just the, the focus on the Ten Commandments really changed things in my mind. And maybe some of y'all are looking at me like, we all believe the Ten Commandments, don't we? But I challenged my church, for example, to memorize the Ten Commandments. Memorize them in order. Most Christians can can try to say the Ten Commandments. I was, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was kind of in one of those uh, boat where, even though I was a pastor, if you ask me, do you know the Ten Commandments? Sure, I know the Ten Commandments. Let's see. Uh, thou shalt not kill. Uh, thou shalt not steal. Uh, don't commit adultery. Um, don't bear false witness. Oh, wait, did I say that one already? You know, and you're sort of counting on your fingers. And I said, no, we need to know the, script, know the Scriptures, what the Bible says of God's moral law, and get it deep into our souls, that's just learning the ABCs. Then we can start to put words together and sentences and paragraphs and start to understand some things. And so we walked through some of that uh, classic understanding of God's law in the Old Testament, especially understanding the distinction between the moral law and the civil law and the ceremonial laws. And then God's, God's um, moral law, that Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and those uses of the law, which is extremely important to understand the difference in uh, the uses of the law. You're probably familiar with those, but as, as, as we look at the different uses of the law, as Calvin uh, taught, I, I like the way Donald J. Barnhouse uh, used an alliteration for that, that the law is, can be seen in three ways, as a muzzle uh, to restrain evil in the world, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if there was less lying and stealing and everything else in, in just the world? And so there's that muzzle restraining evil in the world. And of course, there's a connection there to the, especially the second table of the law and the responsibilities of the civil magistrates and all the rest. But that restraining evil in the world. And then, of course, a mirror to show us our sinfulness. As we look to the Ten Commandments, we are crushed under Mount Sinai there. That we cannot obey the law. 
The Apostle Paul says the law is our schoolmaster that points us to Christ. And so there's that uh, of the Ten Commandments. But then, of course, once we do come to Christ, and we say, God, what do you want me to do? We want to please Him with all of our life. We hear Micah say, God has shown you, O man, what is good. And the law of God becomes a map for our sanctification to show us how to conform our lives to the image of Christ as He works in us both the will and to do for His good pleasure. And so I believe very strongly that there's, so, there's many more connections to the Decalogue in Scripture than we usually see. And this is one of those places that I think it's very clear what the Holy Spirit is doing through the prophet Micah in the 8th century when he says... God has already shown you what is good, O man. It's already been written. It's been written in tablets of stone. And if you think that I'm I'm stretching that connection, I'll, I'll go ahead and build my case that I said. Notice he asked the question, what doth the Lord require of thee? You could click on that and it'll bring you to Deuteronomy chapter 10. You can write that down and look it up later. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. When Moses himself is exegeting the law, it's almost like Micah is giving us a little telegraph. Hey, I want you to connect to this same question that Moses brought up years ago. What does God require of thee? Moses, even in that Deuteronomy chapter 10 passage, uses the imagery of walking relating to the way that we live our lives. The same thing that Micah picks up here in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, as we walk humbly with God. So there's linguistic connections to God's moral law in the Sinai covenant. Not only that, there's not only that linguistic connection, one even stronger earlier in the passage as God reveals himself there in the 8th century in this uh, uh, court case, if you will, as God is bringing against his covenant people. Notice how he reveals himself and what he calls himself. The God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slaves. Out of the house of bondage. Where have we heard that exact language before? Exodus chapter 20. When the law was was given. It's the same words that God used when he was with Moses on Mount Sinai about to give the Ten Commandments. It's the same self-identification that God uses in Micah to bring this covenant lawsuit against his people. And so you see that connection there. So I think it's a pretty strong connection. But then the most obvious is the actual content of what Micah says. He's looking back, he says, God has told you, he's not, I'm fixing to tell you, I'm about to tell you. No, I've already told you, God has already told you what is good. And so he's pointing back to the Ten Commandments. But then when he gives these three imperatives, to love mercy, to to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Let's think through those things for a moment. Well, actually, before we do that, let me, let me beat that drum just a little bit more to make sure that we understand that we can't make things up. We're not to run to our own imaginations. And I'm going to end with this point as well. But it's what God says. When we ask the question, when we gather together for this conference and we ask the question, what are good works? We're not to look into our hearts. We're not to think about things. We're not to try to assess the the culture. No, we're to drive to what God has said. That's That's what Micah is saying here. And so then those three imperatives, those three imperatives, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Notice those first two were sort of a pair there, to do justice and to love mercy. Those are our responsibilities to our fellow human beings. That is our horizontal responsibility, right? And so the first two deals with our horizontal responsibility to other human beings. And then the last one, to walk humbly with our God, is speaking of our responsibility vertically with our Creator. So there's a horizontal component 
and a vertical component. On these two hang the law and the prophets. Oh, I got a little ahead of myself, right? But that's exactly what Jesus taught us, is it not? Jesus said when, when, they were, when people came to him and asked what we were to do, basically a similar question to what the, the people of Israel are asking God in Micah's day, what does God require? What is the greatest commandment? They asked Jesus. Similar question, different words. Jesus answers in the same way. Different words, but the exact same content. To love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. That's our vertical relationship with our Creator. And to love your neighbor as yourself. That's our horizontal, uh, our vertical um, commitment to our Creator. And that, then, uh, secondly, our horizontal relationship with others. And so what Micah is saying is, we don't need to run anywhere other than the Scriptures themselves. Let me see if I want to do this first or second. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. I'll go ahead and do that now. You might be thinking, wait a minute. If we're just going to focus on the Ten Commandments, what about all those other things? I would say all of those other things that we find that are also labeled as good works, and we're going to deal with many of those this week. We looked at one, of course, last night with the, uh, th with the responsibility, the good work of evangelism. How do those, all of those things fall under the Ten Commandments? Well, it's, it, it's very helpful to understand how the Old Testament civil laws fall under those Ten Commandments which is another year of, in the confession. I think in a couple of years we'll be looking at this directly, but I'll go ahead and, and reference it, that the, that the confession explains to us that those Old Testament civil laws have been abrogated, those civil laws that are just for, were just for the, the commonwealth of Israel have been abrogated except for they carry over to today in common, uh, uh, general equity. In the general equity. What I like to do is try to explain it from the bottom shelf. Is basically, it's the principles of those civil laws that are connected to, this is what we can't miss, that are connected to the moral law of God that never changes. It's the moral law that never changes is still applicable today in those three uses. Using it as a muzzle and a mirror and a map. And so when we say, for example, I've been preaching at our, at our church down at Lakeshore. I'm go, we're going through 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter, uh, a few weeks ago, I was in chapter 2, and it's one of those vice lists in the New Testament. There's several vice lists in the New Testament. In 2 Peter, I mean 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, Peter says to put off all malice and deceit and envy and hypocrisy and slander. And so put off those negative things. And if you think about it, every one of those things are connected to one of the moral laws, one or more of the moral laws. Which by, and I'll demonstrate that in a moment, but I'll, I'll mention a resource that's very helpful is the Baptist Catechism. I know some of y'all have been teaching, a few of y'all have been teaching through the Baptist Catechism recently because we've, we've talked about it. An extremely helpful document that came out of the same generation as the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. About a third of that document, the, the catechism, which is about 118 questions and answers, about a third of it deals with the Ten Commandments, with God's moral law. And it's extremely helpful in explaining that the, when, for example, the commandment, thou shalt not commit murder, the uh, commandment number six, is not just don't put a gun to somebody's head and pull the trigger. There's much more involved with that. And so, for example, in, second, in 1 Peter chapter 2, when Peter says to put away all malice, he's really saying, obey the sixth commandment. Because what is malice? Malice is ill will toward a fellow human being. And you might say, Brother Don, mur murder and malice are two different things. Have you been listening to what Jesus has been telling us? Didn't Jesus say if you hate someone in your heart that you're proving that you are a murderer? That you are violating, that you are in violation of the sixth commandment? Is that not what he said? 
And we are murderers at heart. I like that, especially in personal evangelism, personal witnessing, I like dealing with the sixth commandment, murder. Because most people that we're, I'm, in, I'm witnessing to have not committed murder. I, notice I said most. Uh, uh, most have not committed actual murder. But you know what I tell them? I say, the only reason that you hadn't committed murder yet is because you're a coward and you don't want to clean up the mess. They're like, well, no, that's not true. I'm like, no. And sometimes I'll sneak up from around before we talk about that. I'll say, Let, let's just play a little game here. Let's suppose we're walking down the beach, and I'm down on the coast. We're right there on the beach. Say we're walking down the beach, and you come across a bottle. And you open the bottle, and a genie pops out. You, you know the story, right? So a genie pops out, and they're like, oh, good, I get three wishes. And this genie says, no, I don't... I, I'm kind of old genie. I can't give you three wishes. I, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of rusty on a lot of that. I can really only do one thing, and my specialty is I can make somebody disappear. I, I, I can just make them disappear. And when I say disappear, they've disappeared not only from their existence now, but disappear from history. They were never born. They say if if you can think of somebody in your life, go ahead and think. Go ahead and play this game with me in your mind. Is there anybody in your life that if a genie said, I'm going to get rid of them, they never existed, so there's no paper trail, nobody can pin it on you, they're just gone. Many people say, you know, I do know somebody, <laughs> right? It might be an extended family member that's giving you grief. It might be somebody that you work with. You've just proved that you are actually a murderer at heart. I use the funny story to make it jarring. And it might sound cute when I say you don't want to clean up the mess, but it's true. You don't want the guilt. You don't want the social stigma. You don't want the repercussions of the law. But if truth be told, you think you know better than God that gave that person life. And so that's why Peter says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when we come to Christ, we're to put away those things. Put away all malice, all deceit. Of course, deceit, there we are at the, at the ninth commandment, right? Deceit, uh, envy. Put away envy, tenth commandment. Put away all hypocrisy. You might say, where's, the hip, where's hypocrisy? Ninth commandment. Come, are are, are y'all not keeping up? <laughs> the ninth commandment. Uh, hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? We, you, you preached it yourself. The word hypocrisy comes from the, 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 the uh, acting um, uh, guild of putting on a mask and playing a part and hiding the truth and putting on something that is not true. It's a breach of the ninth commandment. So that hypocrisy that we live is really a breach of the ninth commandment. I like talking about hypocrisy too. That's one of those things that people say, well, I'm as they, they balk at the gospel and they want, don't want to come to Christ, they want to attend church, or I'm not a religious person, I, I, I'm not for organized religion, there's too many hypocrites in the church. I tell them, there's not too many hypocrites in the church, we've got plenty of empty pews, we can take a few more. And it's really, we're not the hypocrites, they are. We're the ones who confess that we are sinners in need of a Savior. They're the ones that are preaching the lie that they're okay, you see. And so hypocrisy, we're to put it away. And we can do that with any of these vice lists. They're all connected underneath the Ten Commandments. And so that is why Micah just lays it out on the table. What are you guys talking about? What do you mean you don't understand what God is requiring? He has shown you what is required. There's only ten things. And a deep study of the Ten Commandments is so refreshing. It's hard to kind of articulate this next point that I want to make. But see if, it, see if it makes sense. On the one hand, a really an understanding that the Ten Commandments are our responsibility as believers to please God is at one hand very freeing. We don't have to keep up with uh, you know, 800 rules. There's 10. That's it. We don't have to worry about trying to figure all these things out. It's, there's only 10. We can memorize them. We can quote them in just a few minutes. But at the same time, they're so deep. And they're so invasive. And as soon as we repent of one breach of the holy law of God, we find three or four or five more places where we fall woefully short. 
of God's perfect will. It's a beautiful treasure of God's high standard, revealing His character. And as we are molded into the image of Christ, all of the Scripture points us to God's moral law. Now, I know some of the other preachers this week are going to help us to make sure that we distinguish between law and gospel. And so I pray that there's no blurring of the lines there. We must boldly make that clear distinction But there's many ways to make that distinction. I believe one of the most helpful ways is distinguishing those three uses of the law. That it shows us our sinfulness. And then when we come to Christ, it shows us how to please Him. Because that is what we want to do. We want to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. So let's look at those three categories there. Doing justice. There's a lot of talk about doing justice these days, right? That is why I had to pound the pulpit just a moment ago when we define justice, it must be defined by God's Word. We can't just make it up ourselves. We can't just do what we think might be right. And good intentions don't cut it. Oh, I'm so tempted to go so far into the woods on these Issues that are being talked about so much in our day. But I think many of us are on the same page, and I'll just point out that big banner that we're waving over our head. It's not the social justice that is being defined by godless secular culture, it is biblical justice. God has told you, O oh man, what is good. We cannot back off of that indicative. God has revealed it to us in His Word. And so there is equity. There is equity under the law. Insert in there all the discussions about blind justice and the scales of justice and a sword in her hand, that it is blind. That comes from a biblical Christian worldview that we as a culture are trying to muffle as much as possible. We have taken the blindfold off of Lady Justice and put it over her mouth. God has told you, O man, what is good. He couples that with the next phrase, to love mercy or to love kindness. The Hebrew word there, of course, is hesed. That, I love that word hesed. It's such a, it's a, it's such a big, uh, robust word that we really uh, have trouble translating it into English because it covers so much ground. I like translating it mercy. Kindness is a, also a good translation there as well. And so we want to put those two things together to understand it a bit. And so let me, let me try to do that for us. On the one, on the one hand, I think it's very helpful a very helpful discussion to think of the distinction between justice and mercy. We, 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 we cannot get those two things confused with each other. It's two different things. I'm biting my tongue to not mention Tim Keller. Just confusion there. But there's some t- confusion in our day and age between justice and mercy. Justice is getting what we deserve. Mercy is getting what we do not deserve. I love making that distinction. I'll tell you a story that happened shortly after Hurricane Katrina. As Carrie mentioned a moment ago, we launched a massive mercy ministry in the wake of Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. We helped build houses in the community. We were cleaning property. We were distributing food and relief supplies, especially in those first few weeks that went on for years after that. The immediate relief turned into constructing houses and everything else. But in those early days of just getting food and water to people who desperately needed it, I remember one incident in particular. We were having breakfast, and we had folks from all over the country coming in 
We're sitting there eating breakfast, and we had these two uh, tents, tents set up, Quonset huts set up, like a military, it looked like a military outpost in Iraq or something. And uh, we were giving out food, and a line would form every morning. And so this long line would, would form, and there's people uh, there. And we're on, uh, the, the volunteers were sitting on um, a slab of our neighbor's house. The neighbor's house had blown away with the storm, and there was nothing but the slab left. And we're sitting on that slab eating breakfast, and we, so we look over at, on, on the property right by us, and they're lining up for food. The lady, I can't even remember where she was from, someplace in the other part of the country, she said to me over breakfast, and she looks out, she goes, I want to thank you so much for allowing us to come and help these people. And, and I said, oh, oh, you're welcome. I mean, what else can you do? The whole you know, uh, Good Samaritan can't pass by on the other side and all the rest. And then she said, I love helping people that really, really deserve it. I, I couldn't hold my tongue, Todd. <laughs> I, I'm like, and I usually don't do this personal one-on-one. -on -one. I usually save it for the pulpit, but I couldn't help it. Uh, she threw me a softball. I said, lady, they don't deserve that. They deserve to go to hell. Her mouth dropped. I think she spit her, uh, her sausage out uh, on the table. She's like, what? Yes, they deserve hell. Just like you do and just like I do. I said, let me explain to you. As a Christian, we believe that on August 29th, 2005, God would have been completely justified if he would have sucked not only our homes and our houses and our cars and all our property into, our, into the gulf, but if he would have latched onto our very souls and sucked them into hell, he would have been completely justified in doing so. We deserve nothing but eternal damnation in hell forever. The fact that we are breathing today is a generous mercy and grace of God. I said, so when we give this little bit of food out here, it's not because they deserve it. If we allow that messaging to go out, we're undoing what we're preaching. We're not showing them justice. We're giving them mercy. And we pray that those little tangible acts of mercy would serve as illustrations of the mercy that God grants to repentant sinners. Because brothers and sisters, we cannot stray far from the cross. We must in everything that we do point directly to the good news of the gospel which is that we have broken God's holy moral law that he has revealed to us what is required. We have broken it. We have said we are smarter than you, God. I know, God, you said don't lie, but I really don't want to work, go to work today, and so I'm going to tell them I'm sick. I think I know better than you, God. That's where we are. And because of that, we deserve hell. But God is not only righteous and just, He is also loving and kind and merciful. And God Himself comes to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, lived a sinless life, and died on the cross to pay the penalty of sin for all those who repent of their sin and trust in Him. He was buried on the third day. He rose from the grave, proving that he is victorious over sin, hell, death, and the grave, and that that sacrifice was accepted by a holy God, and we receive mercy. And for those of us who receive mercy, how can we not show mercy and kindness to others? And so that's the, the angle of this full word, hesed, from mercy. But it also is, is we, we will translate it as loving kindness or covenant kindness. And I'm not trying to soften it at all by interpret and using the word kindness. But that's also as well true. That we show kindness to other individuals. That, we, that we're, that we're not, can I say, it's not a Christian virtue to be mean. I know that's a shock to some people today, especially in our reform circles, right? For some reason, we think that's a virtue to be ugly sometimes. No, we're to be kind. But what does that kindness look like? 
We have to define kindness by God's Word. Not by what our good intentions say. Not our blind zeal, as the confession says. But what does God say? Okay, I'll give you a story about explaining this to a lady several years ago. And this was when, and I'm bad with remembering times. Whenever it was with the uh, big court case about the, the baker uh, that, was, that they wanted to make him to make a, a, a cake for a homosexual wedding. Remember that, all that hoopla? And I, I knew a lady who was in a similar situation. She was a, a seamstress, make, made dresses. And a, a lesbian couple came to her asking her to make these dresses. And this seamstress was a Christian. And she said to me, well, Brother Don, I know the Bible says that we're to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And we're to show kindness, so I guess that means I should make the dress. I said, well, well, hold on, wait a minute, let's think about this a little bit more. Is not homosexuality a sin? Yes. Is it damaging to these people? Yes. If you say you want to be treated, or we should treat other people the way that we want to be treated... Do you want, as a Christian, do you want someone to confirm you in your sin? Do you want somebody to, uh, to, to pave the way to allow you to go to destruction? No. You want someone to warn you. You want someone to stop you from sinning. You want a fellow believer to confront you on your sin so that you can repent and come to better in good graces with your God. And so the most loving and kind thing for us to do is preach God's holy law. Because it is good. It is good. And then, of course, he says to walk humbly with your God. Those first first two points us to the second table of the law. The first, the last one, walking humbly with our God. How do we do that? What does it mean, humbly with our God? We could focus on the word humble there, but I think the emphasis actually is the walking with God, and we're to do so humbly. But the walking with God, and when we do so humbly, that is also a connection with the understanding that how are we to walk with God? Not in our own way that we think. It's in deference to His way. In the first table of the law. The first table of the law, of course, tells us how we are to relate to God. In the first commandment, it tells us who we are to worship. In the second commandment that says we're not to make any graven images, tells us how we are to worship. You can insert an entire sermon series there on the regulative principle of the law we're reformed, right? And we know that the second uh, commandment explains how we are to worship. The third commandment, not to take the Lord's name in vain, reminds us why we are to worship. His name is not vain and empty. It is holy and weighty. And the fourth commandment reminds us when we are to worship. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. I'm looking forward to that paragraph in several years here at this conference, by the way. And so God has shown you. He has told you, oh man, what is good according to my watch i guess i got about two minutes for my last point (laughs) and so let's let me let me make sure let me wrap this up we've looked at the positive side restricting it the good things that god wants us to do are in accordance to god's holy law and then the confession reminds us that we're not to make things up we're not to go with blind zeal We're not to uh, go with just good intentions. And that's also dealt with here in the passage in Micah chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. Remember what we've just heard read just a moment ago. Where God brings a lawsuit before his people. And they ask the question, "What what do you want from us? And they give a list of things, right? Did you catch that? Sort of a list. And that list sort of has, seems to have a progression in my mind. They start out with, what does God require? Burnt offerings? Well, that sounds pretty good. I mean, God does talk about burnt offerings. And so it seems like, it seems like they're starting in a good place. A calf of a year old, calves of a year old, you know, the best of the best. That seems somewhat consistent with what God has said in the past. But then, but then they say, a thousand rams? 
They're starting to use hyperbole. 10,000 rivers of oil. Now they're just going crazy. You know, I mean, uh, 10,000. I mean, you can't even have one river of oil. You might have a container of oil. It doesn't even say a river of oil. And so you see the hyperbole building and building and building. And then the kicker at the end of this list of five things that they say, what do you, what do you want? Do you, a burnt offering? A calf of a year old? 10,000, a, a thousand rams? 10,000 rivers of oil? My firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Notice the progression from what seems okay at first to human sacrifice before it's over with. It's like the people are starting at, with good intentions, this blind zeal, something that seems pretty religious. But when you unlatch that, when you cut the anchor that is connected to the moral law of God, you drift into a sea of anything goes. And before you know it, you're bowing at the altar of Molech, sacrificing millions of infants, in our case, before they're even born. That's what happens when we don't listen to what God has simply told you what is good. He says, have no other gods before me. That's good. He says not to make any grave images to worship. That is what is good. He says not to take his name in vain. Oh man, he has told you what is good. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Oh man, he has told you what is good. Honor your father and mother. Oh man, he has told you what is good. Do not murder, he has told you what is good. Do not commit adultery, he has told you what is good. Do not steal, he has told you what is good. Do not Bear false witness against your neighbor. He has told you what is good. Do not covet. He has told you, oh man, what is good. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you have not left us to come up with things on our own. Oh, forgive us, Lord, when we do that. We create factories that manufacture these good works that are not pleasing in your sight. They might seem good to the world, might give us the applause of men, but drag us back to your holy, unchanging word. <laughs> 